I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, roll call, Mrs. Kovach, would you please do the roll call? Hayden hey, Mayor, she is excused. Lisa Collins. Here. Tim Mettinger. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. Here. Jeff Young. Here. Daryl Hancock. Excused. And Anita Jagazin. Here. Okay. Uh, notice of quorum with five of the seven board members present. I will declare a quorum. Uh, board norms reflection. You all have a copy of the board norms in your board file. Um, so keep those in mind as the meeting proceeds. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Second. Okay. Gary and Tom, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion has passed. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We would ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Okay, um, moving on to recognition and thank you. Dr. Mueller. Yeah, tonight um, we'd like to thank Matt Rundy of Rundy Metal Recycling. He donated uh, used parts um, that we'll be able to use on our buses totaling three thousand dollars but actually what it does for us as a district we it actually cost us nine thousand dollars to actually go out and get these parts to, to fix our buses mm. for use so we want to thank them greatly and this isn't the first time they've done that so thank you and then um, we have our you know, we're kind of fortunate. We've had some teachers of the year. Well, now we have the 2015 Wisconsin Early Childhood Special Ed Teacher of the Year, Jackie Getchow. And um, basically, a few words about Jackie. Um, she has a special way of connecting with families as they make a decision as to um, their start with special education services in the district. So we have children as young as three years old. And she really helps with their transitions of the family into the kindergarten. And the parents um, stated that they didn't know what they would do without being able to take Miss Jackie along with their child to kindergarten. Um, we'll be having, she actually goes to receive her award in the Dells on November 13th, and then we're going to have a reception for her in the boardroom on November 19th from 4 to 5. So if you can, please come join us. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, district Administrator's Report, so you can okay. continue. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm happy to report the student Chromebooks have arrived, and um, the tech department has worked it's been working very hard in preparing the Chromebooks for the students at the middle school. Uh, we're looking at them receiving them approximately around the November 10th date in that um, for our eighth graders um, with the sixth and seventh graders following in December. Um, we also had an informational meeting on HRA benefits for our educators. Um, Jay Clark and uh, Lisa Risch have been doing a joint effort very nicely on um, moving forward with information on that topic, um, just so we can make an informed decision as we proceed in the future. Um, then we, uh, myself and a few of the board members, we took a trip to Cochrane Fountain City last week um, for a regional um, WASB meeting. And at that, we have some recognitions of our board members. Um, Anita, next to me here, she for her attendance at meetings and all of the work she's been doing, she got what's called a level four recognition. And they only go up to level five, if I'm right. So that means you've... It's only taken me 18 years. <laughs> so lots of service. And then Kate um, received a level two. And then Lisa received a level one award. So we just want to thank you for your service and appreciate all the work you've done. So... And with that, I think that's, well, there's a lot of other things going on, but I could talk for an hour, so I'll stop now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, reports and discussion. Um, and point one is the 2015-16 budget, original budget. Sometimes it's easier to 
see if that first day the lights is turned on. Uh -oh. And if the projector Projector's comes on, on. That, that makes I it a lot easier. I think we might too. need the projector on. <laughs> yeah, you got a, the power on the projector? We got oh. a blue light, I think it's we're coming. on our way. We can see it now, it's starting. Yeah, it's showing up slowly. Yeah. Well, while we're waiting, um, we have one athletic team that's advancing on, which is our girls' volleyball team, and they'll be playing in Baraboo on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. Um, they became regional champs on, in, let's see, Wanakee on Saturday evening, made the trip. And it was just really neat to see the, all the fans and the students and all together celebrating and showing all their pride, home and pride, because... They were the underdogs, so it's exciting. So, yeah. Good game, too. <laughs> and now on to less exciting things. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's the, uh, Julie will be presenting to you tonight uh, original budget tax levy and then answering any questions that you have. Um, Julie came in to work a little later today because she was not feeling very well, so we're going to try to go real quickly. And I'm only over here because I may need to fill in. Thank you. Good evening. So this format um, will be very similar to the one you saw last month. Um, we'll go through original budget and tax levy, and tonight is the, um, the night the board will approve both the original budget for 15-16 and um, approval of the certification of the 2015 tax levy. So I will be reviewing notable budget, budget changes over um, the budget hearing from September. And this is just a reminder of the budget timeline, and we are at the last bullet point on the screen, the October 2015 approval of the original budget and certification of levy. Um, in the Dropbox was a uh, document called um, the original uh, DPI format budget, uh, very similar to last month. There's screenshots for you to take a look at, and I'll just be um, highlighting certain areas within the budget that have changed over prior month. If you recall at the budget hearing, we talked about the outstanding variables that still needed to come into place um, so that we could uh, certify the levy and adopt the original budget. And those included the equalized property value, the October 15th aid certification from the State Department, and um, the third Friday pupil count in September. On this um, first screen, this is the um, snapshot of the fund balance distribution. The last column is the new column, and it shows the original budget. And um, the audited 14-15 is the one that you want to compare to. And so um, the audited 14-15 fund balance of 9785000 uh, goes up to the top of the original budget, or it's the starting fund balance for July 1st, 2015-16. Uh, fiscal year, and uh, you'll notice an increase um, estimate of 384,000 when you take the projected um, final fund balance for next June 30th um, over the audited June 30th, 2015 number. Um, so we project an increase of 384,000. Um, that's an increase over the proposed, um, specifically because our revenue limit went up. We had more students in the third Friday enrollment count than we used in the proposed budget, and therefore the revenue limit increased. Um, and so we um, are able to afford to, to uh, serve more students here because we have a greater revenue limit and we have more kids to serve with those dollars. Um, this increase in fund balance over proposed is due to that increase in revenue limit. This slide just shows a summary of the beginning fund balance um, plus the operational surplus or, expend or revenue exceeding expenditures for the year and an ending fund balance of projected to be $10,170,000. Next, I'd like to draw your attention to um, page one and line nine, local sources. This is a combination of the property tax levy and mobile home taxes, and you can see the increase from 
$12,818,000 in 2014-15 to $13,728,682 in 2014 um, this increase is $910,000, and it does include the technology referendum of $655,000. Next on line 31 is the state aid general. This is a slight decrease from proposed approximately $22,000 decrease from the proposed, but it's an increase of $575,000 over prior year. The increase in aid and revenue limit over the prior year is a result of the increase in the three-year um, average student membership of 71 pupils, or 71 full-time equivalent membership. Again, we used 56 in the proposed budget. Um, and just a reminder, each district's impact is independent and it's determined by comparing the local factors to the state determined calculated figures. Next, I'd like to draw your attention to line number 73, the support services um, subtotal. There's a decrease from the proposed budget of $132,000. Um, if you recall, in June, there was advanced purchases in both transportation of one bus and also in technology. Those advanced purchases have been removed from their allocation for 15-16. And keep in mind, we will be um, um, adding those back into their allocation for 16-17. But that's the decrease that you see in the support services budget under the original column. Next on line 74, top of the, there you go. Um, this is the Interfund Transfer to Special Education Fund 27. Um, as you are aware, Fund 27 cannot be in a deficit, and so there's a transfer at the end of the fiscal year from the general fund to Fund 27. In 1415, the transfer was $5.9 million. That was an increase over the budget and over the estimate due to um, def delayed the Medicaid reimbursement receipts. And so um, we project that this year we will be able to recoup some of those revenues that were delayed. And so the transfer um, is projected at about $5.6 million. Um, keep in mind, if the, if the Medicaid receipts come back into normal average receding, um, this number will increase a little bit in the following year and then going forward with the inflation. Before I move on to the specifics of the tax levy, are there any questions? Just a couple of questions. On uh, slide eight, um, I think lines 30 and 31, um, state aid went up for the Holman district and have seen in that it was not the case in a lot of districts throughout the state. What, what do you feel led to Holman receiving more state aid than what a lot of other districts did, and many even saw reductions throughout the state. It's largely due to our enrollment increase. Um, we, in fact, had some questions from others uh, on October 15th when the certified equalized aid numbers were released. And uh, as we looked at even some of our neighbors, um, they're experiencing declining enrollment. We're experiencing increasing enrollment. And with increasing enrollment, increased students, increased spending. And the way the equalized aid formula works, uh, the more students and the more you spend, the more aid you receive. So some had thought this to be a, a bit of a windfall or well, how's Holman doing so much? But we have more students to educate. Um, so mm -hmm. I, that's the primary. There's a number of other factors in the equalized aid formula. But as we reviewed it, uh, that was the one that most impacted us. And then the next question is, it always seems like in this year there's always that uncertainty around the budget because the state has their budget negotiations. Well, next year is the second year of the biennial state budget as we look out ahead to next year. The picture sometimes is not as murky um, as we look at that. What effects do we anticipate next year um, with the second year of the state's budget as it reflects to state aid? Uh, 
Um, I was looking to Julie to see if she had done any more updates on that. We are not. We're using the PMA, the agency that we use to help us with our long-range forecasting. We're relying upon them and the ears they have on the ground in Madison and talking to other school districts with what they're doing. Um, I don't see a change, honestly, in the kind of rate of growth or lack of growth in some school districts that we've experienced in recent years. So it would be more of the same rather than a expecting an unusual hardship or some type of uh, larger contributions. Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, there is a categorical increase next year in the second year of the biennium. So we would see a little bit in the line 30 um, increase, uh, also based on our FTE, but I believe there's an increase in the current categorical per pupil for year two. Correct. I'm sorry, I was referring to the equalized aid, but uh, Julie's right, that's another major component of our, our budget. Not, not at the same scale as the equalized aid, but uh, nonetheless an important part. Thank you. Anyone So moving on to the tax levy, our revenue limit, um, this is just showing the, the calculation and how we get to the, the, ta the net tax levy on the revenue limit calculator. The increase in the revenue limit um, was $1,486,000. Uh, the state aid increase that we just spoke about, um, subtracting that from the $1.4 million, um, the state aid increase is $550,000. Um, there was an aid adjustment for over levying last year. Um, and it brings us to um, taxes per revenue limit of $911,000. Um, uh, as spoken about last month, and just a reminder to the board that we are under levying the debt service levy for 1516. This was part of the referendum, um, technology referendum communication that we would not have an impact. Um, so we are levying the 655 in the general fund, but then we're under levying the debt service um, levy that's called for in the schedule for the debt service principal and interest payments due by $387,405 um, for a net tax levy increase of $523,983. So some might ask, how does 655 increase in the general fund get offset by a 387000 Those numbers should match. The reality is our commitment was not to raise it over what was scheduled for this year. So there was a, an increase scheduled for this. And so the combination of eliminating what was going to be an increase, plus then even reducing it from the prior year equals the $355,000. So it is in there. Um, this is the reduction year on year, but add to that what was going to be an increase and you get the 655. Just to add to that, the original debt service levy schedule for 1516 was 3755285 dollars and we are levying 3.1 in the debt service. Okay. The proposed tax levy um, increase of $523,983 is approximately 3.25%. This slide shows you the change over prior year. So for um, 2015, we're recommending the levy certification at $16,678,967. Um, increase over the 2014 amount of $16,154,984, excuse me. Again, 3.25% increase. This shows you the comparison for three years, um, the prior two years audited general and debt service fund levies, and then the proposed um, levy certification for 2015. <clears throat> Gone ahead and updated this chart from last month so that you can see the growth 
Um, Holman is the blue line. Sorry, we're having a little trouble getting this whole thing on the screen tonight. Holman is the blue diamond line that you're following. Um, we talked about this in finance earlier this evening, and the MVC and Holman trend uh, is very similar, um, maybe showing that this area of the state is uh, growing at a more steady pace than state average. You can see the state average is actually been declining for several years. Um, so the last number there in the blue um, is our uh, October 1st equalized valuation from the Department of Revenue. This increase is 4% over last year. Um, just as an aside, our average over the last five years was about 2.5% increase, um, but the last two years we've seen more significant growth locally. The reason that growth is so important is because it goes into the formula to determine the mill rate. And because we had 4% growth, we take the tax rate over the equalized valuation to um, calculate the tax rate that is applied to the property um, for the taxpayers. And so the certification of $16,670,967 in tax levy over the new October 1 equalized value um, gives us a tax rate of 0.01123 or $11.23 per 1,000 of property. Um, this is a mill rate increase of 3.2%. Actually, that's the, isn't the 3.2 is the tax levy increase because the mill rate, as you'll see here in a moment, goes, goes down. So that was the, Tax rate increase. Right. I'm sorry, mail rate is going down over f 2014. There it is. There it is. This is the same as last month, only the, using the new calculated mail rate of $11.23. This gives you an example of how um, your property c would be taxed, and it's only the school district portion of the property tax. So you can use this chart to estimate what your property taxes would be. Now, if your uh, value of your personal property has gone up, uh, you need to take that into consideration when multiplying out or determining the school portion of your tax rate. This slide shows a comparison over prior year on a $100,000 property. Um, the the taxes are approximately $12 less, ranging up to $24 less on a $200,000 property. This is the final slide just showing the distribution between the general fund and the debt service fund. And I'd like to recommend um, the school board certify the levy for 2015 at $16,678,967. Questions? Just more comments than anything. I, I might suggest, and obviously I, I had the question, Mr. Clark, you pointed out on that slide 16, a mill rate increase of 3.2%. I might suggest just clarifying that, just in case anyone would later come back and look at this information, because overall, as, as I sit here and I've looked at the information, I mean, we're looking at an operational surplus and a reduction in our mill rate. Uh, this is, is pretty good news, I think, tonight that we're, we're looking at. And I remember a few months ago, uh, Ms. Holman came to this meeting, and I, I think some of us were a little concerned at that time. And I think, uh, obviously, what we're looking at tonight is a lot different picture than that. So certainly, thank you for, the, for what, what really looks like some good information and some good numbers. Thank you, Tim. that we're looking at. <laughs> the PowerPoint will be corrected and posted to the website. All right. Um, and pull up. Can you pull up the underfunded needs? Oh, 
2016-17 budget ranking order of un and underfunded needs, Dr. Mueller. Good evening. Um, well, part of our budget calendar process that we go through is what we do is we determine what are some of our um, unmet needs or underfunded needs that are occurring that don't fit within the budget that Julie um, and Jay just presented to you. So we went through quite a process where all of our um, principals or budget authorities came forth with their um, prior unmet needs or priorities that they had within their buildings and within their departments um, in our other areas, um, in the business service areas and transportation and so on, buildings and grounds. And then we took the rubric that was board approved and ranked them. And so before you is showing you, and you have this also in your drop box, the listing of all of these. Um, and basically um, at this time, it's just, we're being asked to approve the rank order as presented at our November 9th meeting. So this is for you to see and view tonight and just kind of see what kinds of things um, are happening that we aren't able to fit within our operational budget at this point in time. Okay, any questions? Yeah, Tim. Just for clarification, as I look at the very first one on here, buildings and ground, it's a utility cost oh. increase. Uh, my question is, is I'm not sure how we can unfund or unmeet a utility cost increase. Yeah, you know, what would typically happen was if uh, the utilities exceeded the budget, we wouldn't complete some capital maintenance project to make sure we had the funds, which is one of the reasons why we had to have a referendum mm -hmm. uh, to meet capital projects needs. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, the utility bill has to be paid, mm -hmm. which means something else doesn't get funded. Yeah. Thank you. Said any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> okay. And school board district administrator operating principals, Dr. Mueller. Okay. So, uh, this, as a school board, and myself and Mr. Clark, we met on October 5th, and what we did is we had a work session um, for quite a length of time, from about noon to eight at night in the evening. And what we did is we went through and we really talked about our operating principles. In other words, the relationship of the school board with me as a district administrator, and how should we be operating so that we can function as the as a board that functions to the highest level so that we can get the produce the results for the students in the community in the school district of Holman. So um, tonight what we're doing is just bringing forward um, to start taking a look at these. And one of our recommendations is the board norms that we had before actually fit within our operating principles. So what we're looking at in the future is to we don't need the previous board norms, but they would be worked within our operating principles. Um, with the intention um, down the road to have this available on our website, um, have it, because when we look at the operating principles, it talks about you know the community's relationship with the board, and, and then it looks at the um, staff's relationship with the board or the staff's relationship with me as a district administrator, and kind of talks about our steps and processes and how to go about things. Um, one thing that we'll have to do yet, though, is cross-reference our policies that we have. Um, just make sure that we are, our policies are meeting our operating principles as we had come up with them. So we just wanted to take a look at this this evening with um, approval at our next board meeting of the board norms moving into our operating principles. Any other questions on that or comments? Hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Thanks. Okay, uh, item 10.5, limited term special ed teacher at Evergreen Elementary. Good evening. 
Um, I'm here tonight just to speak for one minute about um, the need for an additional special education teacher at Evergreen. Um, in your materials tonight, you have an issue paper which addresses this. Um, now that our students are all in school and we can see who's all here, we are experiencing a kind of a higher number um, of students, particularly at the kindergarten level, with some pretty high needs. Um, and so this has really resulted in some very high caseloads for our special education teachers. And that's really why an educational assistant isn't, isn't what we're requesting. We're really requesting a teacher to relieve some of the, the high numbers of students per teacher. Um, this will be a limited term just for the rest of this school year. I believe this is also on your consent agenda tonight so that we can get this posted and try to uh, meet the needs of these kids as soon as possible. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Question. What, I was talking about this with my um, son's, my son's teacher, it was a sub actually for my daughter's teacher over at Prairie View and she's in second grade and the sub was telling me, you know, how difficult it is to come into classrooms sometimes and they're different students and how to pick up the pace with that. And she said, you know, one of the biggest factors is when you come into a classroom, how many kids have special needs in that classroom? And she was talking about, you know, there'll be some classrooms she'll come into and she'll have, you know, a high number, which makes it so difficult to control and even have an environment for learning. Do you have a, a cap on like what, how many kids with special needs where there's, you know, you need to do interrupting behavior and redirecting and those kinds of things? How many students in a well, classroom really should we be use a process? Teacher? We use a process called caseload factoring. Okay. And so we apply a factor to each of our special education students okay. when we build our caseloads so that they don't get too high. Okay. Um, when we have, you know, we put our kids into our caseloads, but when it comes to kindergarten, we kind of are guessing every year how many are going to be enrolling in our district. And okay. so I think that's why this year is kind of unique. Mm -hmm. um, there just ended up to be quite a few that just landed in the Evergreen boundary. And so that's right. why Evergreen is experiencing this this year. Okay. But like how many do you think students really should a teacher, can you give a, can you give a estimate you know, that's manageable. It's really not a number because certain students might have a case or a caseload factoring of 1.7, for example. Others might have a caseload factor of 3.5, meaning mm -hmm. they need a much higher level of support. And so we apply that level of support through caseload factoring to determine that. Okay. Um, our policy indicates we should have a caseload factoring of 26 per teacher. Um, and so we use that as a guide, that's a DPI guide. Um, and we do have a policy about caseload factoring and how we, how that whole process works and, and the formulas we use. So um, you certainly can visit that too. Okay. Uh, that can help you to understand better how we apply that. Okay. Thank you. Just, just a comment, and, and I know we've mentioned this before, but we would like to just remind everyone again that these are one of those items that most often voucher schools don't have to address. And people talk about the fact that, well, the money follows the student and what difference does it make? Well, this is why it makes a difference because public schools are, are really, we, we want to do this. It's in the best interest of the student, but the voucher schools don't have to deal with these type of issues. So just remind everyone why we should have concerns around the increasing nature of the voucher schools. And here's another example of that. Mm -hmm. Good point. <clears throat> Um, next, employee handbook language revisions, Melissa Cates. All right, we're gearing back up for <laughs> another year of handbook changes. So um, the language that is being brought forward tonight um, has really been up for review since early last spring. Um, it came to personnel and governance under the form of emergency nursing services policies. And as we look at policies and the ability to move or integrate that language into the employee handbook as appropriate, we take that opportunity to make that change. So um, this language has um, 
gone through uh, lots of review um, several times with the employee relations team. Um, we've spent several meetings on it at the personnel and governance committee level, um, and we've come up with what we have brought forward tonight. This is a change in the current practice. Our current practice requires all employees hired after July 1st, 2001 to be C um, certified in CPR. Um, so we took a look at the utilization of that certifi certification. Um, the costs that we put into providing that certification, the training, um, et cetera, for our employees each year. We do also hire our own trainers for that class um, and came up with this list that you see within the language for employees um, who will be required to be certified in CPR and first aid. Um, it includes um, an extensive list of people who um, their training would likely be more necessary in the role that they hold within the district. So you'll see a lot of times in there the special education um, people who work with the special education students um, will be required to be certified. Um, we also will include um, our crisis teams within each building. So outside of these um, types of classifications, you'll also see additional employees um, who are on the crisis team who will be required to be certified as well. The proposal is to put the language into effect January 1st so we can give advance notice to those employees that um, we are making this change and to also be able to incorporate that change into the emergency nursing services policy within um, the board policy to make that change as well. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. What are we saving here? I mean, do we have, you know, a, a dollar amount of what this saves us in? Not off the top of, I don't Money recall. We did go back um, both. There is lots of opportunity cost, um, mm. I believe, as well. Um, there's lots of clerical time as well that goes into tracking this um, with employees. Um, we also, if an employee doesn't get certified, we don't, there is no penalty for that. So if we're not going to follow through on a policy that we have, if we're not going to enforce that, um, we should okay. really take a look to it, um, what the need of the policy is. Okay. I just wondered too, from the employee's perspective, is there any potential liability to the employer or employee if they're not certified in CPR and something happens when they're on a field trip or when they're with a child and something happens? You know, obviously we've had staff, all staff had been needed to be certified. Um, anyone hired more. after, yeah, 2001. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering if there's any issue with that or protection with that if they aren't. I don't believe legally there's any implications that. Okay. I believe generally the Good Samaritan Law would yeah. follow and that anybody attempting to provide assistance would be mm -hmm. uh, not found to be liable for injury. Okay. Yeah, we really spent a lot of time going through this list and ensuring that in that scenario we would have, um, so a bus driver is on there, um, okay. ensuring that the bus drivers are, and it, again, if you look at the language, the first line says call 911, so um, yeah. that's always something we want our employees to make sure they're doing mm -hmm. in an emergency situation, so. Tim? I'm just kind of trying to get the rationale here, and I, you know, the, I, and I don't want to say one position is more than another, but as I look at this, you know, bus drivers are with them a little piece of the day where the teachers are with them all day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, custodians, I mean, some of them are night custodians, that their interaction is going to be very limited, yet we have them on the list. And I'm just a little maybe concerned that we've narrowed the scope if, um, when we looked at our crisis teams within each building, um, the majority of our crisis team does encompass our teaching staff. Um, as you look from building to building, um, the special education assistants, typically you're going to have those as we um, put children and integrate them into the regular classroom. They will also be within a regular classroom as well. Um, there was lots of rationale that we went into with not putting an administrator on there. Um, for instance, we need to have someone in charge making decisions on who needs to do what next and guiding people to different areas and what needs to happen. Um, so that was part of the rationale as to not putting an administrator on that list. 
Um, so we always have, um, except with the exception of two of our buildings, there's a nurse full-time on staff, there's a health office aide on staff within all those buildings. Um, we have that police liaison officer as well. Um, and the numerous amounts of coaches that we have within our teaching staff um, would also require a vast amount of our teachers to require the certification as well. Mm. So again, I look at all the educational assistants are on there. Why, what was the rationale just behind not having all teachers if we have so many anyway? Was it, I mean, if it was simply a cost situation, you know, we, I probably would like to see them added if it was simply just a cost savings measure. Uh, was there other additional rationale for not having all teachers on that list? Part, part of it, I think, Tim, was looking at the safety of the student and when they're in different places and situations. So like when they're on the bus, we have a bus driver. When they're in the school building, we have our crisis team. Now, as far as the EA goes, a lot of times the EAs are with individual students and might be in a room alone with those students, but... Um, Another example would be the EAs on the playground and being able to offer immediate assistance. The reality with the teachers was that where there's one teacher, there's often lots of teachers. Would we ever have a situation where all of them needed to administer at the same time? <clears throat> so we really had to do more with covering all locations and environments where students are than redundancy in the people there. But other than maybe a little extra cost, what would the harm be in having all of them certified? Uh, just the, the, the time, the activities associated with the bookkeeping and the follow-up if people don't, and the money to train all people when the likelihood of all people ever needing to apply the training is pretty darn slim. The, the one other part, too, is the time that we have built within our time with staff is very limited now for professional development opportunities. So we'd have to ask them to do this outside of working hours. We have to ask them to do it on other days and times. Um, and part of the time, part of the reasoning would be, my guess would be, is with all the other mandates that have come forward with teachers, they're needing to fulfill certain other requirements during those professional development hours. So I think for part of it, it's a relief for some of them. And we will allow staff to continue to become certified. Um, we just won't be paying them to attend the course. So if they're not a required um, classification on this list and they still want to be certified, they're more than welcome to attend that certification training as well. So we are, and we should, for all of those on this list, it is paid time. We are yes. paying them to do that. Yep. still a little hesitant I think just given I mean I, I get it but you know we're talking about the safety of our children and mm -hmm. oh I mean that always kind yeah. of trumps time and paid time and costs and those type of things so completely I completely understand that's certainly why like to see that added I you know that there's been a lot of work on this but I think that that's just a something that I'm still a little uncomfortable with as this sits and maybe I'm the only one but that's no you're not we that's why it's taken us a good nine months to come back with this language because we've gone back and forth so many times um, till we were at a place where we were good with the amount of people on our list. Anyone else? I have one more question. Does DPI give a recommendation on this for either best practices or anything? There's no recommendation out there? No, we did um, review policy of other local districts, La Crosse, Onalaska, and um, we are very um, heavy in our certification requirements. Many are, um, if you want to take it, you can, we'll pay for it, but there's only a certain small amount of people required to. Okay. Um, I believe we are still very heavy on our list of um, staff required compared to other local districts. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have the consent agenda items. Are there any items that anyone would like considered separately? All right. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? 
I do have, um, in the personnel report, we do have one retirement at the end of the year. And um, Sandra Stoddard um, has actually served as an educational assistant at our high school for 14 and a half years. So we just want to thank her for all of her service and time in the school district of Holman. So thank you, Sandra. Any other discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion is passed. Uh, board member reports and discussion. I will call upon the board members in order of roll call and ask you to present any comments or committee reports you would have. Uh, Lisa Collins. I don't have a whole lot to add other than we had our finance committee meeting tonight and we went through in depth the same presentation that happened tonight and um, I guess one thing that sticks out to me in the conversations that we've had is that um, there may appear to be um, more money um, that we have to work with than we initially thought but in further conversation about that um, there's so much more that goes into that um, we don't and that we don't want to be overly confident about the fact that we have this money in the budget um, due to a lot of reasons as far as unanticipated costs and different things um, and who knows what it's going to look like next year so I, I kind of walked away from that thinking um, maybe when it comes time to being so worried about the budget we should just kind of wait and see and not get too worried about it it causes a lot of anxiety I think um, leading into the budget um, cycle and so but also not getting too excited if it looks like we have a windfall of of money So that was one of the big things I walked away from that that meeting with but thank you to Julie and Jay for really working on that so, Okay, all right. Thank you Tim Mettinger. Uh, just a few things and I don't know if everyone or anyone saw uh, yesterday's uh, lacrosse Tribune had the article on the sleepy teens on the very front page article yesterday talking about start times in the schools and uh, you know I, I certainly think that uh, you know that's something that I don't think we as a board have really talked about much but I do think that uh, that does have some concerns and um, something that should be looked at and I understand the challenges with that but if it's in the best interest of the students I think that's where we as a board need to be creative to find ways to overcome those barriers that are, are in the way. Um, obviously, to me, it's, it's putting that student front and center, and is there a way to, to work with that? I know it was a long time ago when I went to school, but I, I, we never started that early when I was in school, and I know even my oldest two, um, the school did not start as early as it does now, and so that has, has changed probably over the last probably 10, 12 years, and that has not always been, been the norm, and I, I think certainly something to look at. Um, somewhat related to the early school start times is something I talk about almost every year this time of year as well. Uh, it's, it's quite a few years ago now that uh, Congress had increased the uh, length of time that daylight savings time goes into the first week of November. And every year I mention how concerning that is to me because the sunrise now is coming after 7.30 in the morning and we have children at the bus stops 6.30 even earlier um, on these dark foggy mornings often wearing dark colored clothes and we know how kids always stand perfectly still and well behaved at the bus stops in the morning and that always is a concern of mine as well to have those kids out there on these dark mornings next week the sun will rise an hour earlier um, and you know that, that kind of clears itself up for a little while but that is another concern with these really really early start times and the increase in daylight savings time a few years ago by the Congressional Act um, increased that as well so just a couple of uh, thoughts there to maybe something we could take a look at Gary Dunlap. I was not going to respond, but I'll respond to both of Tim's comments. <laughs> <laughs> One is the, the uh, early start times. If you read the article, the article also says students prefer to stay up late. Well, I went to bed at 9 o'clock during the school year when I was high school. High school kids, you know, they have to go to school at 7 o'clock, and when they ought to go to bed at 9 10 o'clock, stay up till midnight or 1 o'clock, and we, we cater to when we should bring them to school so they can stay up till 11, 12 o'clock. <laughs> and the other one was, um, what was the other comment we had? 
<laughs> daylight savings. Daylight time. savings time. <laughs> Another concern, you know, we haven't had with the new daylight savings time or the old daylight savings time. I can't remember the last time that we ever had even a close call with a student at a bus stop. And uh, another thing with uh, parent, parents have to be involved with their kids being at the bus stop and make sure they're safe. Um, three of my grandchildren get on the bus at my house and they sit on the porch until we see the bus getting close and then they go out there. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Uh, Tom Cruise. Yes, I'd like to um, <clears throat> congratulate uh, Anita for her time and Kate and Lisa for their time. Um, it was fun going, driving up to um, Cochran with uh, the ladies, uh, even though we broke the speed limit half the time. But anyway, um, <laughs> and the doors of the van were kind of challenging at times too. But it was, uh, it was, a, it was a very enjoyable time. Um, I, uh, one thing I remember from the meeting was John Ashley was the executive director of WASB, and, and what stood out in the meeting for me is he says, and he said it pretty blatantly that school systems in this state are reactive. And I, Jay knows how I, I, and so is Chris and everybody here, I always comment on proactivity and how we gotta be proactive and always thinking the long term. And I experienced that today with the finance committee. I, um, I'm not a real strong numbers guy, but I try to look for trends. And uh, one thing that you know, Jay had commented, when a referendum passes, the reason it passes is because you prepared for it to pass years ahead of time. It's not just some reactive, let's, let's have this ad blitz thing and we'll try our best to we'll make things work. No, we, we, we get the mechanics in place and we try to keep things moving forward. Um, so I was impressed with that and I, it's, uh, it's enjoyable to see that kind of activity and that kind of mindset uh, and Julie as well. She did a really good job, so I really appreciate that. Um, the start times with Tim's comments that the brain is wired by the teenagers to stay up later. So I think you can discipline them, but I do think they are wired that way to some, some degree. And I, even at the uh, WASB meeting, there was a guy, um, one, uh, we would have got a book if all of us went to the meeting, but we didn't get the book. So anyway, um, it was about the brain and I wrote down the title of it and it specifically mentioned in that book about how brains lack of sleep, it, I think it does drag the grades down a little bit, maybe not 100%. My kids got up early, they dealt with it, but they took naps, but I had different situations for school. But I do think it does create some roadblocks and it slows down some of the teacher's hard work by fighting this fatigue factor to some degree. Uh, I also think that school is a malleable, malleable situation. The voucher schools don't address some of the issues that we have to deal with in these schools. I've also read stories where they're doing phenomenal work in other states with disadvantaged kids. So education is a running stream of ideas and we have to constantly be looking at our product and how we can do the best for our community and our students, thanks. Can't wait to hear what Jeff Young has to say about the school <laughs> oh. comments. Uh, can I say my spiel first and then? Because <laughs> okay. I don't know. School, I, personally, I think the school start times at the moment is just like a tad early, but maybe that's because I'm one of the kids that stay up late. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, okay, what I was going to say is about the sports, uh, l this year we've had some, like, legacy setting seasons from, uh, girls volleyball to guys soccer, and for guys soccer, we've had the best season in Holman High School ever, so, it's amazing, but, um, I know we ended our season on Saturday with a loss, but that's fine. It was going to end eventually, and I felt like that time was the best. But I'm going to congratulate Mason Klander, because I don't know how she does it, but she can run cross country and track like unbelievable, and that's really amazing. So she'll be representing us at state. Also, um, show choir selling movie tickets. And their show choir uh, teacher is Troy Larson. And a friend came up to me and said to say this, so I said it. 
And personally, I'm going to buy one just because of the new Star Wars movie, but <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I don't have a lot to say other than we went to the um, WASB meeting. We got um, a lot of information from John Ashley, and then we also had a legislative update, which um, sometimes I feel like I, I keep a pretty close eye on state politics, so I feel like I could tell the guy a couple of things when he's doing the <laughs> But the one thing that he did mention um, that I don't know if everybody's aware of is the, um, the limits that the legislature is considering putting on school districts' ability to hold referendums. I don't know that the public, there's so many things going on at the state level that it's hard to keep track of what's being proposed, what's being voted on. It's just like lightning speed. There's something new every day that it seems is going to impact school districts, and not all of it is in a positive fashion. Um, the referendum um, thing that they're proposing um, now is school districts would only be able to hold referendums at, I believe, two different times during the school year, April and November. And if a referendum fails, a school district would not be allowed to hold that referendum for two years. Oh. So, although when state, when the state, um, you know, when Act 10 went through and they cut schools funding and things like that and they told school districts, you will be, you'll be able to make up some of this funding through holding referendums. We'll see if the local taxpayers want to support you and you can do it that way. And school districts, you know, took up the charge and said, okay, we'll do it. And they did it, and so like 76% of referendums have passed, and so I think that they are not real happy maybe that school districts have been that successful, so they're putting up another little roadblock. So um, I think it's important for people who support public education to maybe contact their people at the state level that are making these decisions that are impacting your child's, your grandkids, your community's education because this is big stuff. This is nothing to look the other way at. This is make it or break it time. So, and this is just one thing. There are a lot of different things that are happening. So keep an eye on all that. Read the Wheeler report every day. It gives a breakdown of everything that's happening. Were they able to say why, Anita, the state has chosen to focus on this as a primary thing? What is the, what is the benefit to I implementing know. this policy or procedure? I don't, I don't, even, I don't want no. to get into that here. But okay. I mean, I, Right, right. So, and that is all I have. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, we have received correspondence. We also have committee written reports. Um, we have our board meeting scheduled November 9th. We have a board meeting, November 23rd board meeting. And then um, you mentioned the WASB awards already and the board meeting reflection. Um, and with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn at, well, pretty darn quick. <laughs> Not as quick as usual, though. But yeah. there's a lot to cover. Yes. Did you make a motion to adjourn? I did. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion and second. Any discussion? And all in favor, say aye. 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 No? No. We are adjourned at 7.58. <laughs> nice job, Have Anita. a good evening. Yeah.